Well, good morning. Welcome to Jerengog Anglican, and uh, thank you for making the effort, particularly in the wet weather, to come out and uh, fellowship with us and in the presence of our Lord Jesus that we love and honour, want to keep serving well throughout our life. Anybody who's uh, visiting here this morning, a special welcome to you. Uh, my name's Graham Begbie and uh, um, Steve asked me to help lead the service this morning and I'm pleased to do that. Um, I was just having a quick look at uh, some of the websites this morning before church and I suddenly noticed the death notice from a man called Larry Crabb, Dr. Larry Crabb. And Larry Crabb was very helpful to me as a younger, younger minister and uh, really put me in touch with just how deeply sin affects our characters, uh, but also how wonderful the grace of God is to work a deep transforming work in our lives. And, um, and so I, I, was, I was sad to read about Larry's death. He was 77. Um, but there's a quote from Larry, and I'll just share it with you. Larry says, he, he was a Christian psychologist, but also a deeply godly man, and uh, wrote some very helpful books. Larry said, beneath the surface of everyone's life, especially the more mature, is an ache that will not go away. It can be ignored, disguised, mislabeled, or submerged by a torrent of activity, but the ache will not disappear. And for good reason, we were designed to enjoy a better world than this. I think he's right. I think that's why we're here, isn't it? Have we got in touch with that ache, that longing? There's got to be something more than just this life. And Larry is now enjoying the fulfilment of that. If, if Jesus is right and we, this life is not the end, it's just the preparation, the apprenticeship for the life to come, Larry is now home and face to face with the Master and the Lord who fills that ache. He's the only one that can satisfy our deepest longings. And uh, so I praise God for Larry Crabb. And I praise him that he reminds us that our ache will find its purpose fulfilled when the Lord Jesus comes back again to take us home. And that's what Steve's going to teach us more about this morning. Um, but uh, let's um, just be blessed with... Uh, we're still not allowed to sing, are we? Ah. So this is one of my favourite hymns. It's a fairly modern hymn called Only a Holy God. So let's listen to this and be, have the music team um, minister to us. Thank you.
be like standing before a holy God. The Apostle Paul Peter wrote to his fellow Christians nearly 2,000 years ago and this is what he said, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. And then Peter asked this question of his readers. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? It's not a bad question, is it? What kind of people should we be? I found a confession prayer written by John Wesley um, of, what was he, around the 1700s, was he? The late 1700s? I don't know, I'm guessing. He was a long time ago. He's an old fellow and he's gone now. But uh, a very godly leader. And John Wesley wrote this confession prayer, which I think is one that would be good for us all to pray together. So will you join me in this prayer? Forgive them all, O Lord, our sins of omission and our sins of commission, the sins of our youth, and the sins of our riper years, the sins of our souls, and the sins of our bodies, our secret and our more open sins, our sins of ignorance and surprise, and our more deliberate and presumptuous sins, the sins we have done to please ourselves, and the sins we have done to please others the sins we know and remember, and the sins we have forgotten, the sins we have striven to hide from others, and the sins by which we have made others offend. Forgive them, O Lord, forgive them for, for his sake, who died for our sins and rose for our justification, and now stands at thy right hand to make intercession for us. Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we feel the weight of those words, we need to hear the word of God spoken to those sins. The Apostle John wrote these lovely words in his letter. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son purifies us from all sin. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and he will forgive us our sins and purify us 
from all unrighteousness. Praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Um, if you had a chance to have a look at the bulletin this week, you'll see that we are looking at how we can support and encourage our link missionaries. So there's a short film here with three couples, CMS missionaries, uh, not ours, but other people, just reflecting on the things that they find encouraging from their supporting congregations. Thank you, Sue. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labour, labour in vain. And in his wisdom, God does his work, not through some of us on our own, but through all of us in fellowship. And uh, whether that be the, the prayers of CMS supporters, that chorus of voices prompted by God's spirit, uh, the financial support, that kind of work of self-sacrificial financial giving, that is God's spirit, bearing the fruit of generosity in the hearts of believers, uh, the commitment to global mission such that you would care for and encourage laborers in the harvest in far-flung places. All of that is utterly critical to the work God is doing through CMS. Oh, we couldn't go to Kenya without the support of brothers and sisters back home. Your support, your financial giving enables us to go to a country that can't provide the finances for theological education and that extends your ministry. Uh, we need your prayers for wisdom as we minister in a very different context. Uh, we need your prayers for our children as they settle into a different world. Uh, we need your prayers uh, for the work of the Spirit in the hearts of the people that we are ministering to. Yeah, we have been so overwhelmed over these last few months. Um, just being able to meet people who we've never actually met before, but who have been praying for us and who know who we are, know our names, know our kids' birthdays. Um, just little things like that is, yeah, is, to me, is what partnership is all about, is, is us being in a relationship with each other. And so it's us knowing, knowing you and you knowing us. And, and as we go, we get to take you guys with us and you guys are constantly in our minds and in our hearts and in our prayers. And, and we know that we will be in your hearts, minds and prayers. And, and we just love that. And we're so excited to be doing this with all of you um, behind us. We've also through doing deputation noticed that there are some people who are really quite keen um, and, and mission minded. Mm -hmm. And we've actually been able to, and you know, tap people on the shoulder, encourage them about the advocate program that CMS has and say, you know what, um, you could help your minister out here. You seem really keen on mission. How about you sign up to be an advocate? And so there's really been that two way process. And there's even been people we've said, whether training up and going yourselves might be uh, something that's really worthwhile for you. So we feel the love, we feel the support, but this is really a two-way partnership. And, and, and being here, we've been able to build on that, um, whether we were on location or not, and we're, we're so grateful for that. It's a partnership. It's not just us going, it's us in fellowship and partnership yeah. with all of you. Life as a missionary can be quite isolating at times. We had two of our children overseas and one of our link churches had a virtual baby shower where they met and celebrated the birth of one of our boys and then sent us some things that weren't available locally. That was a great blessing to us to know that they were celebrating along with us even though we were a long way from them. Uh, but also I think the thing that's really struck us uh, and how we felt cared for and supported by churches is people responding regularly to our prayer letters and our prayer points. Um, writing us emails saying we prayed for you, these are the things we prayed, uh, here's a Bible verse that's encouraged us, I hope it encourages you in your situation. Um, people write, writing follow-ups to prayer letters, that, that person that you spoke of months ago, how are they going now? Um, those kind of things are so meaningful and just help to show us the care and support that comes from churches in Australia.
Well, that gives us a few ideas uh, how we can really support and encourage our link missionaries. The CMS ones, the cows, of course, and the glovers. And I'll just mention that the cows, because uh, in Italy at the moment there's a third wave of the virus. They're talking about lockdown again. So they really need our prayers at this time. So how are we going to respond to this? Um, how are we going to care for them? Are we going to pray for them in the week ahead? And just one thought for you, in your Bible studies groups this week, what about when you're sharing prayer points, what about you pray for the cows and the glovers? And then what about when you have prayed for them, how about you take a picture of your group and send it to them? It, on the bulletin, are their emails address, send it to them with a short message. It doesn't have to be anything profound, it can be just... This is our Bible study group, and we prayed for you today. So let's see what we can do collectively to support them through this coming week. Thank you. Our first reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 25. Jesus relates the story of the ten bridesmaids. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The five who were foolish took no oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all lay down and slept. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and welcome him. All the bridesmaids got up and pre prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil, because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, We don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Sir, open the door for us. But he called back, I don't know you, so stay awake and be prepared, because you do not know the day or hour of my return. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a trip. He called together his servants and gave them money to invest for him. While he was gone, he gave five bags of gold to one, two bags of gold to another, and one bag of gold to the last dividing it in proportion to their abilities, and then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of gold began immediately to invest the money and soon doubled it. The servant with two bags of gold also went right to work and doubled the money. But the servant who received the one bag of gold dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money for safekeeping. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of the, how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of gold said, Sir, you gave me five bags of gold to invest and I have doubled the amount. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Next came the servant who had received the two bags of gold. And with the report, Sir, you gave me two bags of gold to invest, and I have doubled the amount. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with the one bag of gold came and said, Sir, I know you are a hard man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth, and here it is. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy servant. You think I'm a hard man, do you? Harvesting crops I didn't plant and gathering crops I didn't cultivate. Well, you should at least have put my money into the bank so I could have some interest. Take the money from the servant and give it to the one with the ten bags of gold. To those who use well, what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who are unfaithful, 
even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. And we continue with Matthew 25. The Lord Jesus tells this stories. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come you, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick, you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. And then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me they also will answer, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And then they will go away to eternal punishment but the righteous to eternal life. And this is the word of the Lord. Our music team are going to come and uh, encourage us again by singing for us. Come and stand before your maker. i 
Lovely to see you all. Let me quickly pray and then we'll look at God's word together. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together again, uh, to gather around your word, to sing your praises, kind of, um, to pray um, and also to focus on and listen to you. Lord, we thank you that you've promised that when two or three gather, you are there with them and we thank you that you are here this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to us, that you would encourage us and indeed that you would challenge us. Uh, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I hate waiting. I really hate, I hate waiting at traffic lights. Um, I hate waiting for holidays to come around. Um, only six days to go. Um, and I hate waiting at the RMS. Um, it always seems such a waste of time. You sit there, you play with your phone for a little bit, you, you watch the second hand go around, and you watch the numbers tick over. And you know how they've got the codes there where you know, the A's and the B's and the R's and the V's and whatever it might be, they don't seem to bear any resemblance to whatever it is you're doing. But whatever happens, it's always the other numbers that go faster. I hate that. I hate waiting. And you, you may can imagine, let me tell you a story about a, a man uh, who shall remain nameless who went to the RMS and was sitting there waiting and seeing the other numbers going and, and realising that it's taking some time, figured oh, I've had so many in the last of my numbers in the last half an hour, I've got another four or five to go, I could probably duck out and quickly go to the shop and come back. Ducked out to the shop and of course what happened? The number comes up, comes, home, comes back and sure enough, missed your turn and you have to start all over again. How annoying. How annoying. Let me tell you another story about a man who had to wait. Uh, a man who uh, fell in love with a girl and uh, decided to ask her to marry him. And uh, the problem was she was studying overseas, living and studying overseas for a while. Uh, so he couldn't wait for her to come back. So he went over, uh, met her in the country where she was. Um, and while they were there, uh, he proposed to her. She said yes, amazingly. Uh, and, but then he had to come home and she was still there and the problem was he couldn't, it wasn't in the days of Facebook when uh, you, know, you, you announce straight away and you show the pictures of the ring and all these the perfectly manicured photos that you put up, had to wait till she came back to actually tell anyone that, that he was engaged. How annoying is that? What should that man do as he is waiting? Waiting waiting. Maybe there's someone here who I could get married to quicker. <laughs> How do you think that would go down when his bride-to-be came home and found you going out with some other girl? Not so good, I would think. Uh, this is to totally uh, random and made-up example. I don't know of anyone <laughs> like that. Today's passage, we are gonna be, Jesus is going to be talking about people who are waiting. 
And this is the passage, you know, sometimes when you come to church and you hear Bible readings, or you, you, you maybe read it in your own quiet times, uh, if, if sometimes you, you read a passage, you can kind of pretend, it, it feels like it's come out of nowhere. But we must remember that actually these verses haven't come out of nowhere. They've actually come from, as, as part of the passage that we've been looking at. And so we thought we'd start off this, this morning by actually giving you a little bit of a test. Um, we started off in Matthew 21 a few weeks back. Can anybody remember what happened in Matthew chapter 21? Jesus came into Jerusalem. Very good. And when he came into Jerusalem, where did he go? To the temple. Very good. I get you warming up. It's excellent. Jesus came into the temple. And what did he do? He turned over all the tables and threw them down and birds of money flying everywhere. Um, pigs. Oh, no, probably not pigs. But... Uh, <coughs> Definitely not pigs. Um, but all these kids are flying around and, and uh, Bedlam. And while he was there, um, he also started to have a conflict with someone. Who did he have conflict with? The Pharisees, the religious leaders. That's right. You're all on top of it now. Um, and, he, and they came at him with all these questions. They came to trip him up. And I won't test you with the kind of questions that they ask. But you may remember some of them, about something about marriage and something about paying taxes to Caesar, those kind of ones. Remember those? Excellent. You guys are on fire. Uh, and so Jesus had this conflict with these guys, but eventually, at the end of that chapter, they kind of went away kind of with their tail between their legs because they weren't able to trip him up. Then, in chapter 23, something, well, something changed. What happened in chapter 23? Can you remember? If you've got a Bible, you can cheat. That's fine. What happened in chapter 23? Well, let me tell you. Chap well, actually, chapter 23, so, chapter 22, the religious leaders came at Jesus with their questions. They, they failed. Chapter 23, Jesus turned the tables on them and he started having a go at them, talking about their hypocrisy, right? They're all there. Woe to you, you hypocrites. Remember that? Excellent. That's right. Um, it was a challenging passage for us, I seem to remember. But Jesus had a real challenge for these guys because they were leading people away from God rather than leading them to God. Okay. Then last week, we saw Jesus' disciples leave that place of conflict, the temple, and they're leaving the city. And as they go, the disciples said something. Can you remember what it was? Look at this beautiful building. Look at this beautiful te this temple, how fantastic it is. And Jesus' response was what? It's going to be destroyed, isn't it? And so last week, we looked in chapter 24 about Jesus saying, this temple that you think is so fantastic, it's going to be destroyed. But what's more, I'm going to come back. And he, and he spoke a lot about his return. And the main, the real take-home from last week was that Jesus is certainly coming back one day and we need to be ready. Okay, So that's where we've been so far. Now, chapter 25 just follows on straight from that because Jesus is still part of the same conversation. Jesus tells the disciples three stories Three parables. Because, you know, sometimes when you're trying to get something across, it's hard for people to understand. And so sometimes a story can help you to understand it. Okay? And so Jesus tells three parables to really hit home that message that he's just spoken about. Okay? So there are three parables that are pretty familiar to some of us. And let's have a quick look at them. Um, in verse 1 to 13, the parable of the ten bridesmaids or the ten virgins. Um, and this scene is set at a, at a first century Jewish wedding. We're thinking a lot about weddings at our house at the moment. Um, and we just had one and we've got another one coming up because you, there's too much is not enough. Uh, and so there's lots of kind of excitement, but also a bit of stress about organising all those kind of things. You've probably been through there before, many of you. You've, you know what that's like. Well, in the first century, um, one of the, these two, we have these two people, a bride and a groom, who are betrothed to each other. They're not quite married yet. Um, but the groom has gone away. Now, what he's gone away for, we're not quite sure. He's gone away to make preparations. Maybe he's gone to uh, put an you know, extension on the house, or maybe he's been living in a bachelor pad and he's got to clean the house. So it could take a long time. Um, he's gone away. We don't know how long it's going to go for, but the bridal party kind of hangs around waiting. And they could be there for quite some time. And there are 10 bridesmaids. The Lord said, imagine 10 bridesmaids. Goodness. Did anyone here have 10? No? Maybe next time. Uh, 10 bridesmaids are waiting for this groom to come back. 
And we're told that there are five wise ones and five foolish ones. The five wise ones have brought their oil for their lamps, but they've also brought spare oil. The others haven't. And so we'll find out why that's tragedy, because the, the groom takes a long time getting back, it, and they keep waiting and waiting and waiting. When he finally does arrive, they've all fallen asleep. And so the, the call goes out, the bridegroom is here, let's get ready. And so they get there, they're ready to kind of process in, you know, instead of having the flowers, they've got their beautiful lamps, and so they put their lamps, and the, the, uh, the foolish ones try to light their lamps, but there's no oil, of course, because it's all burned out. And they've got to go to the other girls, can you help us? We've got no oil. I said, well, no, we can't, because we've only got enough for ourselves. What are they going to do? All right, they, quick, they, they rush off, they go to 7-Eleven to try and find some oil. Unfortunately, it's past 11, it's midnight, um, and also 7-Elevens haven't been invented yet, so they've got a bit of a problem. But while they're away, trying to find some oil, the bridegroom arrives, and the wedding ceremony is, is getting ready to start, and they walk in together, and the door is closed behind them. Finally, the five foolish girls come back, and the door is closed. They knock on the door, please let us in, we're here, we're ready to go. But then you hear those chilling words. The bridegroom comes to the door and he says, I never knew you. Awful, isn't it? I mean, bad enough that you've, you've rushed off in the middle of the night and you've been waiting for all this time and then, and then to miss out. But of course, this is not just a story about some random wedding back in the first century. Jesus is trying to make a point. And in case we don't get it, um, he tells us in verse 13 what his point is. Keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. He's saying to us, keep watch. We do not know the day or the hour. I have to confess, I'm a bit of a last minute person. Um, I like doing things last minute. I don't like um, getting to things really early because I figure if I, if I get there 15 minutes early, that's 15 minutes of stuff I could be doing at home. Um, and so I'm going to aim to be there right on time. So whether it's a train or a plane or whatever, try to get there as close to when the thing's ready to go as I can. Um, and I was a bit like that. I have to confess also at university um, with assignments and things, you know, this day before. I wonder what that assignment's about, that kind of thing. Um, if you get it in four or five hours early, well, that's four or five hours of wasted time, really. You could have been doing other things for a lot of time. Um, I'm a bit, I don't, is there any other last minute people here? Yeah, a couple. Um, Gary's still doing the presentation for the um, Treasurer's Report. Um, <laughs> some people are last minute kind of people. Uh, but some people are, are last minute people with God too. They treat God that way. They put off thinking about God and responding to God. We, they know kind of that there's, there's something that we've got to do about you know, Jesus, God, Bible, something. We've got to work out to do, deal with that. And eternal life. I'll work that out, but I'm not quite ready for that. There's, there's other things I want to do. There's things I want to achieve in my career. There's things I want to do with my family. There are places I want to travel to. Uh, all these kinds of things. There's all these different excuses come out about putting God off. But the chilling news of this parable is that eventually, if you keep doing that, there will be a time when time will run out. And at that point, you can't kind of go to God, oh, oh you know what, I was going to do something about this, God. I was, going to, I was going to respond to you at some point. I was going to work out what Jesus, what this whole idea of Jesus dying for me is, is all about. I was going to work that out at some point, but I never quite got around to it. Can we do it now? Well, the answer will be, no, I never knew you. What a tragedy that would be. For Christ to return or to stand before him and for him to say those four horrible words, I never knew you. And so as we think about the, the, the fact that Christ is coming back, the, probably the most important thing that we can do is to make sure that we are ready for that day. We actually need to stop putting things off. Stop putting God off. Stop trying to make excuses for other things that need to that you need to do or achieve or, or to experience in life, deal with him now. Because you never know the day or the hour, says Jesus. You'll never know and you need to be ready. 
So the first and most important thing for you to me, the question for me to ask you today is, are you ready? If Christ returned right now, would you be ready? Would he, would he say to you, yes, I welcome you, or no, I never knew you? So if you were to be ready, what would that look like? Well, that's really what the next two parables are about. So the second parable, parable of the talents. Again, it's one that, we, that people will know quite well, I, I imagine. Um, but for those who don't, let me go through it very quickly. Basically, again, another man goes away. This time it's not a bridegroom, it's a master, it's a, it's a landowner. And as he goes away, he leaves his landholding um, to his servants to look after. And he gives them sums of money. One person gives five talents, one two, one just one. But even for the person who's one, it's a large sum of money. It's a huge sum of money that he is responsible for. These three servants are responsible for. What are they going to do while he's away? Well, they could spend it, they could invest it, or they could sit on it. The first two do the second. They t as soon as, as the master goes, they put the money to work. I don't know whether they invest in the stock exchange or maybe they buy some property or maybe they invest in a business, whatever it might be. Um, they, in they put this money to work um, and it starts earning income. The third servant does something really weird. He's been given this huge sum of money and he takes it home, digs a hole and buries it. Why? What an odd thing to do. Doesn't put it in the bank. Maybe he's one of those people who kind of keeps his money under his mattress kind of thing and his master's money or keep it extra safe or bury it. We're not told just yet why he does that. But eventually the master returns. Just like the bridegroom comes back, the master comes back and he's come to settle accounts. So he calls the servants in and the first two come to him. First one comes with the, the, who's given the five talents. He says, what have you done with it? Well, I've doubled it. I've now got five more. I've got ten. Fantastic. Not a bad little investment. Comes the second servant. What have you done? I gave you two. I've got two more. Fantastic. This is going well. We know exactly what's going to happen with the, first, the third guy, don't we? He's got one. He's going to end up with one. Because... He comes back to his master and in verse 24, we, we start to understand a little bit of what's going on in this guy's mind. The man who received the one talent said, Master, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground and see, here is what belongs to you. Why did this guy go and bury his money. He was afraid. Why? Why was he afraid? The other two weren't afraid. Why was he afraid? Because he didn't trust his master. He had all these uh, bad reports, whether he'd heard these bad reports or whether he experienced it, we don't know. But he says he actually accused his master of being a hard man, a, a con man. Who, who exploits other people. Now, as we look at what he's done, with how he responds to the, the other two, is that true? Well, it doesn't seem to be, does it? So, but this guy's got it in his head that that's what the master is like, and so he, he buries it and brings it back, and there it is. And so how does the master respond to these two, these two groups? Well, to the first two, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been trustworthy with a little, and now I'll put you in, in charge of a lot. Come and share your master's happiness. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's fantastic. It doesn't sound like somebody who's really uh, out to exploit them. In fact, he doesn't even take the money back from them, notice. Um, they get to keep it. But the third one, the one who didn't trust the master, the one who accused him of being wicked and evil, he actually takes the money back off him and throws him out into the darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's, a, it's an awful story um, for that guy. Great for the other two. Not so good for him. So what are we, why does Jesus tell this story? Well, again, you don't have to be Einstein to work out what's going on here, do you? To realise that we are these servants. That God has given us a treasure so what is the treasure that God has given us? Well, he's given us word. He's given us the gospel, hasn't he? 
He's given us the gospel of salvation. And sometimes we are tempted to keep it in, aren't we? We're tempted to hide it away. You've heard of people describing themselves perhaps as a closet Christian. That's somebody who believes in God but doesn't want to tell, let anyone know that because, well, that would be just a bit embarrassing or whatever it might be. Or this is a private thing. That's like the third, the third servant who takes that treasure and hides it away. So yes, we've all received the gospel and that is part of our treasure, but I don't think that's just what he's talking about here. Yes, I think he's talking about the gospel, but notice how he gives each of the servants different amounts. He gives five to one, two to one, and one to the other. I think one of the things that Jesus is talking about is not just our, our, our salvation, which is true, but, but all of the things that we give us. Think about your life for a moment. Think about the good things that you have. What are, what are some of the good things that you have in your life? Financial. Financial. So you've got money. Anyone here has got any money in the bank? No. Yeah, so we've got money. Yeah, yeah. What else? Your yeah, your family. So your children, um, grandchildren, yeah, family members. Church. A church is a, is a great blessing, isn't it? Yeah. Somewhere to live. A <laughs> church. What do you mean sometimes? Um, Sometimes you go to other churches, right? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so we've got, we got homes to live in, yeah? Education. We've got an education. Good We've got good health, many of us. Abilities. We've got abilities, things that we're able to do. We've got time on our hands, some of us more than others. Um, and notice how we, we've got money. Some have got more and some have got less. When we've got houses, some have got bigger houses, some have got smaller houses. Some have got small families, some have got big families. Some have got lots of talents and some have got just a few things that they can do. Some have got lots of time on their hands and some have got none. You see, God has given us so many things that we should give thanks to him for, but he doesn't just give us these things for ourselves. Notice that the, the, the servants were given the money to go so that they might go and use it to expand the master's uh, holdings, to expand his investments. They, they're given it so they might serve the master. And the same, of course, is true of us. All of these things that we have, our money, our education, our time, um, our relationships, our jobs, uh, our homes, our cars, our holidays, all of these things have been given to us, not just for us, but for him. And so one of the things we need to do is to examine ourselves and go, well, what are we doing with the things that God has given to us? How do you use your house to serve God? Do you? How do you use your money to serve God? Do you? What about your time? What about your, your gifts, your, your, your abilities? What about your families? What about your car? How do you use these to serve God? One of the things that Jesus is calling on us here is to live out our faith. You see, the, the, the third servant refused to use these things for God because he didn't for, for the master because he didn't trust him. What a tragedy it would be for us to be given all these things by God, but then to say, "Well, God, we didn't really use them for you because, well, they they were just I just wanted them for myself." But. By contrast, what a great blessing it would be to hear those wonderful six words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Wouldn't that be fantastic for Jesus to return? You see him face to face and him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Wouldn't it be good to join with Paul and say, I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. Now there is in store for me this crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. Wouldn't it be great to be able to say that of your life? This is a beautiful passage for those who, who do live for God, but it's a sobering one for those who won't. Our treasures will be removed from us and we'll be excluded from his kingdom if we do not use them for him. Which, of course, leads us to the last parable, the last story. It's more of a metaphor, really, than a parable. Jesus says, when he comes again, it's going to be like a big courtroom and everyone will come in and the Son of Man will take his place on the throne and he will separate the sheep from the goats, the cat from the dogs, the, the tomatoes from the cucumbers, or whatever, however you want to do it. He's going to separate them into two groups. One group will go off to et receive eternal life. One will go off to receive eternal judgment. 
How? Are they just, how do we decide between the two? How do we know which one's which? Well, the first group, Jesus says, you can come in and rejoice and, and ex experience all my glory because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was uh, thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was without a home, you welcomed me in. When I was uh, naked, you clothed me. When I was sick or in prison, you visited me. And they're kind of going, hang on a minute. I don't remember that, Jesus. Because far from, I never met you face to face. How could I have done that? How could I possibly have done those things? But Jesus says, well, as much as you've done this to the least of these, these others, you've done for me. When you're serving others, you're really serving me. The second group, of course, is cursed and sent off to the eternal fire because they refuse to do those things. You see, when Jesus returns, there will be two groups of people and you'll be in one or you'll be in the other. And I will be in one or the other. Now we need to be careful at how we work out about, about how we apply this passage because Jesus is not saying that the way you get to heaven is by helping the old ladies across the street or by uh, feeding the poor or by, uh, or by uh, clothing people or, or whatever it might be. You see, in the end, I think what Jesus is saying is that uh, the same thing that his brother said, actually, in James chapter 2, uh, when he writes, if a person claims to, be, to have faith but has no deeds, how can such faith save them? Because faith without deeds is dead. It's like the, um, the servant in the, in the middle parable. He didn't invest the, the, father, the master's money because he didn't trust him. That what he did was an expression of how he felt. And so it is for us. The things that we do are an expression of what's on the inside. Jesus says that a, a good tree will bear good fruit, a bad tree will bear bad fruit. And so the obvious question we have to ask ourselves is what kind of fruit do we bear? Are we actually living out what Jesus, uh, the faith that we have? Does it show in itself in a care for the poor? It's all very well to be theologically correct, but what about morally? Socially, do we care for those in need? How do we use our homes and our, our money, our finances and our time? Are we stingy with the things that we have? We'll, say, we'll give God this little bit, but not all of the stuff that we have. What kind of fruit are you bearing? Jesus is coming to the end of his life. In less than a week, he's going to be dead. Um, he will have been crucified. And so he's not, he's not beating around the bush here. He's only got a couple of days to instill in his disciples these powerful, this powerful message. In the end, Jesus is going to say something to you. Will it be, I never knew you? Or will it be, well done, good and faithful servant. Which one would you prefer? It's a pretty easy question, isn't it? Um, of course, it's the second. So let me encourage you to, first of all, make sure that you are ready for him. Make sure that you've, you have responded to his offer of salvation that comes through Christ's death on the cross that we'll be celebrating in a couple of weeks' time at Easter. Make sure you've taken hold of that. But also make sure, having taken hold of it, that it actually does something to you, that it changes you, that it changes me, that it makes me more loving, it makes me more generous, it makes me more on the, out, on the lookout to see how I can care for others. Use your gifts, use your talents, use your money, use your house, use your life for him, that when Christ returns, he will find us ready and he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Let me pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for this passage of warning. Um, Lord, we pray, I pray for everybody in this room that you would help each one of us to be ready. We know that Christ will return just as surely as he rose from the dead. We know he will be back. So Lord, we pray that we'd be ready for when he comes back. Help us to be focused uh, on him and on his glory. We thank you for all the gifts you've given to us, Lord, for the salvation we have, but also for the material gifts that we have. Lord, we pray that everything that we have, we might lay at your feet for you to use.
Please take us and use us to extend your kingdom and to build your glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Steve, for your challenge this morning. It really is a great challenge for us as we um, look on our lives and how blessed we are here in Australia. Uh, in, in a world that's going through so many problems at the moment, we seem to be relatively isolated from it. And to a living Jorongong, it sometimes appears to be living in paradise, doesn't it? And uh, we, we, we often take these uh, things for granted. And yet, um, we're living in a world that needs much prayer. And as Christians, we're called to pray because God always hears our prayers and always listens and responds uh, to them. Uh, prayer is a great privilege for the Christian person. And sometimes we can struggle with our individual prayers, and uh, God knows that. So this morning we're coming together collectively to, to pray for a number of things that, um, that affect us collectively here in Jeringong and in our church and in our world. And specifically this morning, um, I'm going to be um, praying for uh, the work of Mission and, and CMS. So um, whether you're here this morning in the body or you're watching on, uh, on, on YouTube, uh, let, let us now uh, come together and pray. Lord, we thank you for the church that we have here. We thank you, Lord, that we can now be gathering together uh, in fellowship, th that we can hear your word. And we thank you, Lord, that this morning that we'll be having our annual general meeting um, immediately after this service. And we pray, Lord, that you'll be with us in that meeting, that we'll be listening to the reports of the things that have been happening um, in, the, in the past year, but also, Lord, looking forward to, to our future as a church and all the things that will happen um, over, the, over the next year. And we pray, Lord, for the people who offer themselves for various positions in the church, as wardens and Paris councillors, uh, nominators, we pray, Lord, that you might call your people to, to stand uh, and that in doing so that they might serve and um, really help in the building up of your kingdom here in uh, Jerengong. We pray, Lord, for those involved in the planning and the finance uh, of our, our church and also our plans for a future to um, have better facilities and buildings here. We, we pray for all those involved in that. We pray to the Lord for those who lead Bible studies in the parish and for the people who attend. Lord, that we might grow in fellowship, that we might be caring for each other and that we might encourage each other in love and fellowship. We also pray for the witness of our church in the community, and we pray, Lord, that in doing so, that we might encourage others to come along to church uh, to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, in our community here, in our church, there are many people that we know, and also in our lives and our neighbors who are encountering times of problems and difficulties. We're now just going to take a few moments uh, break now just to individually bow our heads in prayer and just pray for the people that we know who are going through difficulties and need our prayer. I will now continue uh, to pray for the, the work of CMS. And we pray for its work and for its missionaries in many different parts of the world. And we pray, Lord, for the society's funding. And we rejoice that uh, they've not been greatly affected, that they've been able to uh, send out more missionaries into many different parts of the world. And we pray, Lord, that more people will continue to offer themselves for, for missionary work. And we pray, Lord, in our church for the, the group of people who are our missionary committee. And we thank you for the dedication of their work uh, in encouraging and promoting missionary work in our church. 
And we pray, Lord, for the link missionaries that we have with CMS. We pray for the Cal, Simon and Jess Cal, and their family in Bari, in Italy. And Lord, Italy is going through very difficult times at the moment. 26,000 people just in one day, yesterday, came down with COVID-19. We pray, Lord, for your protection upon them and for their family in these very difficult and dark times. Lord, pray for them and keep them strong and safe. And we pray, Lord, for their continuing work in difficult circumstances <clears throat> as they uh, support uh, the students at the universities um, in Bari and Foggia, uh, that they might encourage them and be able to keep in contact with them despite all the difficulties, that they can really remain in an, in an encouraging role there in a very small and uh, very difficult church, in a very difficult environment. And we pray, Lord, for us that we might encourage them in a time when they need encouragement. Lord, we're conscious that their family life is rather stressed and difficult, especially having young children. And we pray, Lord, that we might encourage them through our Bible studies, in sending them letters and pictures, just to encourage them in a time of great difficulty. Because, Lord, we know that they have sacrificed so much to go to, to Italy and to serve you there. And we pray for their families in Australia who miss Simon and Jess and their children and for them missing their families in Australia. So, Lord, be with them through these difficult days. We pray also now for Andrew and Liz Glover serving with CMS um, in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. Lord, we thank you that they can be in Australia at the present time and that they're able to catch up with us here in Jeringong, uh, with their family and, and with their friends. But Lord, we pray for this struggling church in Non Phen, really that is going through great difficulties um, at the present time. We pray for Christina Leong, who is the church administrator, who is holding things together at the moment. But Lord, we pray that they'll be able to find another location to have their services as they're not able to go back to where they've been meeting. Lord, open up doors there for them to, to find a new place to meet. And we pray for their finances, Lord. And we're conscious that Andrew and Liz have had to take a huge cut in, in their pay and to have to move into, into a different location because of their finances. Lord, be with this church because so many of the people who go to it have, have left Cambodia and returned to their home countries. And we pray, Lord, for the return of their youth worker who, who's presently in Ireland. Finally, Lord, we pray for us. And we thank you for the challenge that Steve gave us this morning to really know who we are in the, as the people of the Lord Jesus Christ and to know that we have been given talents and gifts that we can use in your service. And we pray for our mission we pray, Lord, that we might testify to Jesus Christ, that we might seek opportunities to, to bring people to you, to encourage others to know Jesus. We remember the words that Jesus gave in Matthew 28, to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that you might give us each of, here, each of us here this morning the opportunity and the words, the courage to speak about our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and, and in, in his changing call that is there for all people. We're going to say now together the Lord's Prayer to conclude our time of prayer this morning. We pray together, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, ever and ever. Amen. As the
band comes up, just a couple of quick announcements. Just to remind you that straight after the service, well, as soon as we can after the service, will be our annual general meeting. Um, this is an opportunity for us to, um, to hear a little bit about last year and to think about the future together. It's also an opportunity for us to, uh, to elect people to different positions. And uh, one of the things that is we are in need of at the moment, I, we have uh, parish council and wardens uh, have been nominated, but we actually need some more um, nominators, which are people who uh, would, if I leave, like get hit by a bus or something, um, would actually then have to go out and find a, a replacement for me. So um, it's, it's a great job to do because you don't have to do anything this year. So um, I hope. Yeah, I hope. Um, so yes, so that's, that's that. Also, just a reminder that on the 23rd, so not this Tuesday, but the Tuesday after, is our um, next midweek service. Starts here at 10.15 in the hall for uh, morning tea, BYA morning tea. And then uh, we go and have service in the hall. Graham will be leading that. Um, and so I hope you're able to come and join us for that as well. That would be really great. I'll hand it to Graham. Why don't we stand for our final song, Crown Him. Remember the question the Apostle Peter asked? 
since everything will be ended in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? And his answer is, you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Brothers and sisters, may our God and Father himself and our dear Lord Jesus Christ make you to increase and abound in love to one another and to all people so that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before our God and our Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus with all his saints. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.